Okay, we're back with the 20 and 20 podcast. Thanks for joining us. Our next guest is, was the first pick in the 1978 NBA draft. He's a two-time NBA world champion with the Showtime Lakers, and he's the current color commentator for Lakers Radio, Mr. Michael Thompson. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Gee, you sound, so, right. formal. You sound so formal. You have to be formal. We have to be formal. You know, Mike, <laughs> with Michael, and we have to laugh. When I think about Michael, you know, with some, a very good ball player. And you know something, Michael, I was thinking? When you played with me, when we played together, your stats were like 20 points and about nine rebounds, because I was a leading rebounder, but he says he was, because our numbers were exactly the same. But I played two, two fewer games or something. You know, so, but, Michael, if you had those stats now, just think about that. 20 and like 10, you'd probably be, gosh, how many centers are, are, are scoring that kind of, having those kind of numbers now, Mike? Oh, oh, believe me, uh, me and Stu Lance and all us old timers, we always talk about that stuff, about if we were playing now and putting up the numbers we put up in our prime, the money we would be making. I mean, I would be probably a max player, probably sign one of those five-year, $150 million deals. You know, and it's all relative, though, because when I came in the league, I mean, think about it. This is 1978. And even today in 2023, if the ordinary citizen was making the money I was making in 1978, which is $250,000 a year, think of the, um, the ordinary American citizen. I think the average salary in America is around 60. So even $250,000 a year, people, majority of Americans would, or people in the world would love to make that kind of money. So when I came in the league in 78, think of the guys who were uh, five, say 10, 15 years before me, I saw the money I was making because guys back in those days were probably making 50,000. Uh, and then all of a sudden it, go, and it just keeps going up uh, every few years, just keeps jumping up crazier and crazier numbers. Well, you know something, most people, because Michael, you played so many years ago, um, just tell people about the history of you coming from the Bahamas and how you got from the Bahamas to the University of Minnesota and from that point on. Oh man, it was a tough journey. I had to build a raft out of a coconut <laughs> and I went down to the beach one day when, it's, when the current was running uh, east to west towards Florida. And I said, now's the time to set off on my journey. So I loaded my raft up with a bunch of supplies, a lot of water for about uh, three weeks supplies. It's going to take me about three weeks to get to Florida through the Gulf Stream. And I was out in the middle of the ocean and uh, suffering from heat stroke and supplies. My raft was surrounded by sharks. I didn't know if I was going to make it. And all of a sudden, there was in front of me Land Ho, Florida, about 40, 30 miles away. And somehow I paddled into shore and got into shore that way. Is that a good enough story for you? <laughs> so you had a really good high school team. Tell us about that when you got to Florida. Yeah, I was uh, actually discovered by accident by my high school coach. He came over to Nassau in the Bahamas, which is only a 30-minute flight away from Miami, looking for another kid named Thompson, another tall kid named Charles Thompson. He came to my house by mistake. And saw how tall I was at 17 years of age. I was about six foot eight, 190, 200 pounds, skinny, looking like the Pink Panther. And he saw me, and uh, he, even though he came to the wrong house by mistake, he asked me, Do we play basketball anyway, son? And he saw how tall I was. And not really, I just was playing in the driveway or playing in a church league, nothing really formal. Like I didn't really play high school basketball growing up in the Bahamas. I didn't start playing until I went to Florida and uh, played as a junior. And anyway, so he comes to my house by mistake. And after my father and my oldest brother talked about the possibility of me going to Miami and rolling high school over there to further my education and to see where basketball could take me, that's how I ended up in Miami with uh, three other Bahamians uh, playing for the Miami Jackson High School team. And in 1974, uh, we had four Bahamians from the Bahamas on the team who were in the starting lineup. And the other two players, the fifth man and the sixth man, were Cuban-Americans who were more Cuban than Americans. So we basically were a foreign team playing high school ball in Miami, Florida, and the state of Florida, which is very competitive. And we ended up being the number one high school team in the country. And this is before, you know, McDonald's and all that stuff, of course, but we were considered the best high school team in the country. We went 33-0. and 0. We didn't have a shot clock back then, guys. Now, you got to remember, this is 32-minute games. And we were so good, we would score in the 90s and the 100s a lot of times, and teams would have to hold the ball against us so we wouldn't yeah. blow them out by 30 points. We were an amazing team. Well, who did you live with when you got to um, Florida, Michael? I found a, a lady, my coach found a lady in the school district, um, about a 10-block walk to school. And uh, the, uh, it was a former player from Miami Jackson. Uh, he, his uh, mother took me in, and I lived in her room. And I had about uh, 20 roommates, and they were all cockroaches. 
<laughs> and probably, probably she's in the mental institution having you. <laughs> That's right. She she cooked for me. She cooked for me the first night I was in her house, and the food was so greasy and so bad. I said I can't eat here no more. So I had to I had to go out and get my own food after that. Where did you get money from? My father from? would send the money over. You know, oh, my okay. brother, one of my brothers would come over to Miami, and he was into the import-export car business a lot. So he would come over to Miami a lot, and he would bring some food over that my mother would prepare. This was, you might remember, this was, this was back in 1978. So travel, uh, traveling with food and other items was a lot less restrictive than it is now mm -hmm. because of TSA and all that other stuff going on. So he could easily bring food over for my mother prepared or bring, bring me some money for spending money for my father. So... I was, and you know, when you're in high school, you just want to hang out with your boys, eat McDonald's, eat a cheeseburger. You don't really want for much. Just as long as you have something to eat every day, you're happy. So tell me, from there, how did you get to Minnesota? All the places to go, from warm weather in Bahamas to Minneapolis, freezing. Yeah, I, I still, yeah, I still, still puzzles me how I made that decision because I could have chosen to go to University of Houston with a couple of my teammates. Florida, Florida State, also recruited me. To go there, but at that time, you gotta remember this was 1978, and Florida, Florida State didn't have the facilities that they have now. They play, basically played in a high school style gym or size gym. And it was like, geez, this is much of a difference playing for Miami Jackson coming to Florida State in this small little arena. Same thing in Florida. It's not like how it is now. Uh, you imagine it now. So I also, I also got uh, uh, recruited by Wisconsin, but Minnesota came along, Bill Musselman and, and, uh, it was. I took my visit up there. I remember leaving Miami to go on my recruiting visit after the season, and this was like um, I think in January. So I leave. I put on. They tell me, well, Michael, you better bring uh, something warm to wear because it's kind of cold up here. So I said, okay, I'll be put on my little letter sweater my, with my J on it from Miami Jackson High School. And I, so I put that on. Left Miami. It was 80 degrees when I left Miami in January. Landed in Minneapolis. It was 16 degrees, one six. <laughs> I couldn't believe how cold it was. I couldn't believe people lived in that kind of weather. That's the first time I've ever seen snow. I thought, I'm never coming back to this place. It was so cold. <laughs> you know, that's so funny. Your story sounds like a Lajuan story. Because when he came from uh, Africa, he went to um, St. John's. Yeah, he was in New York. And it was so cold. He says, well, let me see what's who's <laughs> So I just got to pick up the right former. He said, I'm, I'm staying here. <laughs> so, Michael, right. went up there. So, so you decide to go to Minnesota, and you had some great teammates up there. Yeah, I did. Uh, my freshman year, man, we had, we were loaded as, as freshmen. We had Mark Oberding, who you guys remember him, of course, played yeah. in the NBA for a long time. Uh, Mark Landsberger, who played with the, the Lakers and won a title in 1980 with them. He yeah. was on that, our front line, too. And we also, we were a bunch of freshmen coming in, and we were so good as freshmen. We unseated the senior upperclassmen. They, they had juniors and seniors in front of us, and we we benched those guys so Bill Musselman could play the freshman. That's how good we were. And of course, uh, after Bill Musselman left, he tried to take me to the ABA to play for the San Diego Sales, offering me one hundred eighty thousand dollars to leave college after my freshman year, one hundred eighty thousand dollars a year to go play for the San Diego Sales in the ABA at the time. But I wasn't really thinking. And one hundred eighty thousand dollars back then—that was a lot of money. That's like making ten million dollars a day. So how it felt like, how it seemed like, or how it sounded like. But I wasn't was a, as a freshman. I was in a different mindset than the freshman you see today, who can't wait to get to the NBA, one and done, or even out of high school. I didn't think I was ready for the pros to go play against people like Kermit Washington and Dr. J and Artis Gilmore and stuff like that. I was just trying to figure out a way to stay eligible for my sophomore year and how to go into my sophomore year of college. So. I wasn't in the mind frame of, I got to go pro, I got to go pro. I wasn't even thinking that way after my junior year, even though I had an opportunity to do it. I was enjoying college, and I got a chance to play with guys like Ray Williams. You guys remember him, of course, longtime New York Nick, one of the great, mm -hmm. one of the great players in college. Kevin McHale came along after that, and we got to play two years together. But, yeah, we had, uh, ex I, we had a great team in Minnesota in 1977. The year that Al McGuire and Marquette won the title. We went to Milwaukee that year and beat and the dominated uh, Marquette, but we couldn't go to the uh, NCAA tournament when they were carrying 32 teams back then, even though we qualified because of uh, we were on probation because of the previous uh, regime of players who broke some of the rules. So we had to pay the price for it. So we were put on probation. So we weren't allowed to go to the NCAA tournament that year. And even Al McGuire said after he won the title, the best player, uh, team in the country is Minnesota, even though they won it. 
Well, tell me this, you know, Michael, when you became a junior, or a senior, okay, you came up, you went four years of school, or did you come out your junior year? Four years, four years. I could have come four out years. my junior year. I could have come out my junior year, but I heard that if I left school that year, I was thinking about it, but if I left school that year, I was projected to be drafted by the Buffalo Braves. And I didn't want to leave Minnesota to go play in more snow. So I said, I didn't stay in school another year. I didn't want to go play in Buffalo. So when you, when you came out your senior year, tell me this, who was your agent, first of all? Erwin Wiener, who was the agent for the great Dr. J at the time, who was the obviously the, the, the most uh, exciting player in the game and probably the biggest draw in the game at that time, back in 1978. Yeah. So uh, Erwin Wiener was my agent, and uh, he was a really good agent. Well, you know something, Michael, when you came into the league, you had your beads on. What kind of beads were those you were wearing when you could play? Your behind they the were tamarind, Yeah, tamarind seed beads, tamarind. Tamarind seeds, uh, they're very, yeah. it's a kind of a fruit that grows down there, and then you dry the beads out after you take them out of the fruit, and you can color them up and uh, paint them up and dye them different colors. So they were tamarind seeds from the, from the islands. So when you went to Portland as the first round, the first player pick, who else was in that draft, Michael? Let's see. I was the number one pick. The number two pick was Phil Ford. The number okay. three pick was Rick Roby. Phil Ford out of okay. North Carolina, Rick Roby out of Kentucky. The fourth pick was Purvis Short. Mm -hmm. The fifth pick, I think, was, oh, I might forget who that was. But the sixth pick was some stiff that nobody ever heard of. And I'm sure the Blazers were glad they took me over Larry Bird, of course. <laughs> and uh, the seventh pick was, uh, was Ron Brewer. But, yeah, Larry Bird was in that draft. And, and I got drafted in front of him only because, uh, for, for some reason, other teams didn't want to wait for Larry Bird. He had another year of eligibility because he sat out the year. He's a transfer player. So he had another year at Indiana State. And, and Larry Bird let everybody know, well, I'm going back to school for another year to try to win a championship. So... The five teams before the Celtics said, well, we don't want to wait for Larry Bird. How stupid was that, right? So but <laughs> Brad Auerbach yeah. said, you know what? We'll, we'll draft him and wait a year for him. So obviously, Larry Bird was well worth waiting five years for. Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. What, so, what, uh, what, did you, like a lot of players, have a, a welcome to the NBA moment? Something that was you know, impactful to you, whether it was something physical or just being in awe of the environment? Well, I mean... I would guess my welcome to the NBA moment sort of humbled me. I, and I kind of, matter of fact, Kermit, I still own an obscure record in the NBA right now for number one picks. I can't believe it's lasted this long. I have, for the first two games, I have scored the most points in the first two games, debut games for a number one pick in history. I think it's 60. I had 23 my first game against the Chicago Bulls, 37 my second game against the Kansas City Chiefs, Kansas City Royals. At the time, yeah, I think they were the Royals or the Kings. And then in my third game against Denver, you know, I'm thinking, boy, this NBA is not so tough. I'm in here averaging <laughs> around 30 points a game. I guess I am a great player. Anyway, I, we, yeah, we go to Denver. We go to Denver the third game, and I figure, hey, I got this down. I'm going to be an all-pro. My, my, my third game against Dan Issel and the, the Nuggets, I was 1 for 11 for two points. Talk about coming back down to earth. That was oh, wow. my welcome to the NBA and be humbled moment. But see, people don't realize how good Dan Issel was. You know, my yeah. Dan Issel could play. Oh yeah, yeah. He was he was like probably the first stretch five center because he's he he didn't post up much. He could post up, but he was really good facing the basket and shooting and threes. And, and uh, thinking, you know, I used to have to check yep. him because Kareem Kareem says I can't check him. Because I'll get right. in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> because he was yeah, and he could shoot. So yeah, exactly. you had to go out on him. So, yep. Michael, how was uh, Maurice um, healthy? And he Maurice has let you score all those points from Portland. Was he hurt? But Maurice yeah, when uh, when I first started, Maurice was out. He, he So he oh. was out for the first month of the season. So I started right away along with Tom Owens up front. And then when Maurice came back a month later, then I went to the bench. And sometimes Jack Ramsey would start me at small forward, which I hated because then I would have to chase around people like Walter Davis yeah, and Marcus yeah. Johnson. And as you know, yeah. if you're a big guy, you'd much prefer to play against guys like Artis Gilmore than chase yeah. around a guy like Walter Davis or, or David Thompson. So I had to play small forward at my height, and that was tough. You know, Michael, you know, you're, with, your with your talent um, nowadays, would you be playing a forward or a center now? 
Well, basically, I'd be doing both because kind of positionless now because centers, even as big and as strong as Joel Embiid is, he's outside a lot shooting threes, shooting uh, face up jump shots. So it's almost like the low post, uh, only the low post uh, stay in the set, uh, post plus center is now gone. DeAndre Ayton, another seven foot talented player, he's out there shooting threes. So I, my game would definitely evolve and I'd be outside too, especially if I'm playing center. I try to take those big boys off the dribble a little bit more because they don't want to move their feet. But yeah, the days of just posting up and, you know, but that's, that's a great question because I, of, I often ask people if Kareem or Shaq or Hakeem was playing in today's NBA, would they just stay in the post? Would Kareem just stay in the post or would Kareem float outside and start shooting threes? Would Kareem go away from shooting that hook as much because now he wants to shoot threes? It, it, the way the game has evolved. But I don't know. I don't know. I think if you still had those guys, you still want to throw the ball in the post and let them go to work. Well, you know, because Kareem, you know, I played with him for three years and you played with him for a couple of years. You know, of all the different shots, of all the different players, his was the most consistent, the most reliable, that, that hook. I mean, you just couldn't stop him. Now, you're right. Nowadays, now, could he stop or play against some of the centers nowadays? They might have played more zone because they, you know, they're going to put it, send him out there to check somebody because you go right by seven two guy. And it's not that it's lack of defense; it's just that he can't move his feet fast enough to do that. So right. they, I just always have to check. I don't know about you, Michael, when you were there. I have to check Moses Malone, Dan Issel, when I was with Kareem, all the guys that were quick that would get him in foul trouble. And they, what they would say, well, if Kermit fouls out, well, we don't care. <laughs> we cannot let Kareem foul out. So when you were down there with the Lakers, Michael, did you play um, a lot of the uh, guys like Issel and all the other guys to protect um, protect um, Kareem? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I would sometimes pick, pick up uh, Robert Parrish if uh, Greg Kite was in the game or obviously or Kevin McHale, so Kareem would have to go over there and guard him. And believe me, you and I were – we were sacrificial lambs, and that's the way it should be. Because when you got a franchise player like a Kareem <laughs> or a Patrick Ewing, a David Robinson, Hakeem Olajuwon, a Shaq, you got to protect those guys because you're not going to win unless those guys are on the floor. So we have to sacrifice and have to foul out or take uh, the fouls for them. You want your best player on the floor, not sitting over there on the bench in foul trouble. You know, and so another thing, you know, since you're around the Lakers with LeBron and all these guys, we always debate that. And like T.O. and I debated it last night. I still say, from for my sake, Michael Jordan is the greatest player that's ever played. Um, and you look at his leadership. I mean, when you look at that sh show, um, Last Dance, not only was he a, he was a leader, he, yeah, he made those guys play harder than they would play. And I look at LeBron. LeBron doesn't do that, does he, Michael? Does he yell at the guys, make them do what they're, they're not doing? Does he make them responsible or, or, or in a sense like that? Oh, yeah. He's been doing it. Haven't you been watching LeBron the last 20 years? He's been doing this in, in Cleveland, did it in Miami, even with if it was even though it was Dwayne Wade's team. LeBron's always been a leader that way. He's been doing it since he's been here with the Lakers. He definitely is very vocal on the floor. Where they, if he was sitting on the bench, he coaches guys when he's on the bench during timeouts or while they're on the floor. So, yeah, LeBron's very vocal, uh, as, as like how a Jordan or Magic Johnson was. And um, a lot of people, it's either, it's either between him, Kareem, Wilt. And uh, Jordan, who's the greatest player. I, I can't believe an old head like you just look, overlook a guy like Will Chamberlain or Kareem and just annoy no, no, Michael no. Jordan. No. But you know what, though? Here's the thing. The reason I say Michael Jordan is that Michael was 6'6". Six, six. Now, Will, I knew Will. I, no, 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 wait. I knew Will. I knew Kareem. But they were just, he's just like you, Michael, playing his guys that are five foot or something like that. You're going to dominate them. And people no, 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 no. Short, that makes no foot. sense. Then okay, why aren't all these other seven footers dominating like like a Wilt? They're not playing against seven footers every night, but you don't see them putting up Wilt and Kareem numbers. Yeah, but they, but you know what? It, 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 they're not Wilt or Kareem. Either. But that's you what know, I'm but, saying. Yeah, but see, I think you know what I'm saying. I think Kareem. See, when he, they keep comparing who's the best, I think what they should do each position: who's the greatest of all time. And then you're going to argue about that because you have Bill Russell, you have Will, well, you have Kareem, you have Kalonji Wong. Let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Who's the greatest high school player ever? Kareem, right? Oh, yes, for sure. Who's the greatest college player ever? Kareem, right? Kareem, yes. And he's arguably the greatest NBA player ever when you look at it, what he's accomplished in his record. And you got to remember, LeBron broke his record, yes, but Kareem had a, he had a four-year head start on Kareem. If Kareem came in at 18, Kareem would have probably scored 42,000 points. That's true. That's true. Because Kareem was, you know, they, they didn't even let him play in college his first year. 
Right. And he would have won yeah. four championships then if he had done that in college. But you know, the captain, you know, Captain Neil, he was he was you know what you played with him. I used to say Kareem before games, I, how do you feel? If you say I feel good, I said, Oh, we're gonna win tonight. <laughs> we would yeah. go on the road with Kareem, I'm sure you the same way. And we were at six games, we win five of them. You know, because that's toward the end of the, you know, the last year I was with the team, the last couple of years, because I had so much confidence in Kareem. Because he was consistent, he was a professional. Yeah. He he didn't yep. he didn't have any attitude or anything, and so I, I just I just think you know I would go to different positions. I think Michael's a, in the greatest. In just my opinion, Mike. I mean, Mike is not is not saying that what I'm saying is right. I comparing him to LeBron, they both are at the top. You know, the top of the tree. So who do you think is the greatest? I mean, I think it's Kareem. You're not wrong. For saying it's Jordan, nobody's wrong for saying Jordan. Of course, most people think it's Jordan, but I think it's I think Kareem's in, the, in discussion seriously. So is LeBron. You got to put LeBron in there. It's a four man discussion. And how how we continue to just ignore and overlook Will Chamberlain and forget about yeah. him? When you look yeah. at the record book, every time they bring up a player's accomplishment, they say he's the first player since Will Chamberlain to do this. You know, That's and Will true. was so dominant. And, and, and even Bill Russell said he's the greatest player that ever played the game and built. Bill couldn't do anything against Wilts as great as Bill Russell was. So I just think Will Chamberlain is overlooked too much. It's like looking at a beautiful sunset or the Grand Canyon, and you're not impressed. Okay, do this, do this for because I know you. We always used to argue with Michael, and you can never win an argument with Michael. You go from each position in Michael and tell me the greatest player at each position. One, two, three, four, and five. Well, that's, for me. that's easy. That's easy. The greatest point guard ever, Magic Johnson. That's I the agree. end of discussion. Nobody will ever surpass him there. Greatest shooting guard, like you said, it is Michael Jordan. No discussion there, even though Kobe Bryant could uh, be an honorable mention, of course, the closest one to Michael Jordan. Greatest forward, or so let's say, okay, the two greatest forwards, two, two greatest forwards are LeBron James and probably, I'll, I'll give the edge to, ooh, it's between Karl Malone and Tim Duncan. I'll give the edge to Duncan because of his five championships that he led the Spurs to. And of course, the greatest center, is Kareem, even though I, I, if you want to say Wilt, I wouldn't call you crazy. So for me, my starting all-time five are Magic Jordan, LeBron, Duncan, and Kareem. You put up any five against that, and you won't have a chance. How about Carl Malone at the five, at the four? You don't like him? I mean, yeah, that's a, yeah. He's the only other guy who could argue in the argument for Tim with Tim Duncan. So it's between those two. Well, what was it like for you when you you have been in some winning situations, but then you? You got moved to to LA. Uh, what was it like going into that? Because you know you went to the, like the upper level of winning at that point. Yeah, it's a whole different level. It's like moving from the say the fifth floor in a condo up to the penthouse. You know, even though you live in a nice, <laughs> even though you're living in a nice condo, you're very comfortable there, and it's a beautiful view. But now you go up into the uh, up to the penthouse, which is worth twenty million, a hundred million dollars. That's what's like playing for the Lakers because you get to the Lakers and. We were, as Kermit knows, we were a decent team in Portland. We were a good team. We were a playoff uh, contender every year, consistent about that. But when you got to the Lakers and Showtime, you were expected to get to the finals and win. Anything short of that was a monumental failure and, and, uh, just, and just a huge disappointment. Just making the playoffs, getting to the finals, not good enough. You were expected to win. And that during that time, if you were a Celtic or a Laker. You know, Michael, we were talking about stacked teams. Now that was a stacked team you had with the Lakers. Four of you guys were the number one players picked in the entire draft. That has never happened before and probably will never happen again. It was you, was it Worthy? No, it was you, Kobe, and Worthy. Yeah. So you had four yeah. guys. And then you had a couple of twos and threes. That was it. So what was it like playing with that team? I mean, for, for first of all, you were a star and a starter everywhere else. Now you go down there and you start sometimes, but you're coming off the bench. You yeah, didn't mind I, at all? yeah. After an eight-year career, I joined him when I was like 31 years of age, but I was in the best shape of my best shape of my life, 31, because <laughs> you know you were pumping iron, Kermit. You and I, wait, you wait, and I were wait, like wait. the pioneers. Michael. Wait, don't say no. Michael still, I guarantee you, has a picture of him pumping iron in his wallet when he pulled out. Of you course. still have that? Oh, my. I don't got those pictures. <laughs> I don't got those pictures. Oh, we were going yeah, they, they inspire me to stay in shape like that. But uh, yeah, we at 31, I joined the Lakers, and um, being uh, being around those guys was it, it was demanding uh, because you know Pat Riley. We worked hard. We were in, in impeccable shape. It was very demanding, but 
when you look across the room and you see James Worthy and Magic Johnson, Byron Scott, Michael Cooper, Kareem, Kurt Rambis, AC Green, these guys were NBA champions. And to be surrounded by that kind of talent and that kind of uh, professionalism, uh, it, a lot of pressure came with that. And it was a serious locker room. There was no goofing around, no loud music being played. It was all business. And uh, we would, Magic would say, we'll have fun after we win. But right now, let's take care of business. So once you join that team and that locker room, it's time to grow up and be an adult. Well, Michael, you were always such a jokester. Now, how did they take you at first? Or were you just quiet for a second? <laughs> were you quiet at first when you joined that team? No, they didn't like me because of my intelligence <laughs> and my looks. <laughs> I had a tough time in that locker room because uh, they, were, you know, they, they were so jealous of me. Michael would yeah, lecture so all of them. I mean, he would lecture yeah. all I swear, every day about something. I said, Michael, please. You know, when you, you walk in there looking like a Bahamian guard, like a Caribbean guard, not a Greek guard, but an island guard, you know. It's like Kermit, like Kermit knows. We were the first ones pumping iron. So I used to go over to Gold's Gym, Kern, and pump iron over there with Mr. Mr. Olympia, Sean Ray, and all those guys that you know. And I would come back and let these guys see how cut I am because, uh, you know, I was trying to get arms like David Robinson. So when you combine uh, a physique like that with the looks and, and the brain, it was uh, oh. hard for those guys to keep up. So they oh, didn't really, they, sometimes they sort of isolated, uh, you know, sort of uh, dis distanced themselves away from me because they couldn't keep up intellectually. Okay, on the bus. On except, the bus the except for Kareem. Except for Kareem. Kareem was, very, Kareem was very intelligent, as you all know. But he doesn't say very much, though. No, he, he's an no, introvert. No. He was very introverted back then. He was very introverted back then. Uh, he's changed a lot in the 70s, 60s, and 70s. He's now mm -hmm. much more outgoing. He laughs more now. So Kareem has, has become, a, he's changed 180 degrees from what he used to be. He's mm -hmm. more of an extrovert now, not so much an introvert. Well, you know what? He's playing with him. I, I tell people, it's funny, in my locker room, in my room in college, I have big picture of Kareem and Sidney Wicks and a couple other guys. Also, a couple of years later, I'm playing with these guys. I mean, it's unbelievable. Michael, first of all, but you know, about the championships, when you used to come back to Portland and you came back and, and you know, we were all proud of you, even though you drive us crazy all the time. We were always proud of you because you always were a professional. And, and T.O., something, see, I never had a play on Portland. I, there was no play for Kerr in Washington. So I would tell Michael, Michael, give me the ball. Just throw me the ball, please, one or two times. So I can have a couple of dunks or something. <laughs> Michael, you know, because Jack Ramsey, I didn't have any plays. I mean, you know, even though we were cut and had the basic plays, you know, they never looked for me, really. They didn't. And because I made the All-Star team, is because Michael and Maurice Lucas were hurt there. So I got a lot yeah, of money. Yeah, because you, you work at, you were like, he was like T.O. He was like, uh, I guess if you could compare Kermit to who plays the game today, he was like a Draymond Green. He did all the dirty work, re rebound, play tough defense, show up every night. So he was like a bigger version. of he, Kermit was a lot bigger and stronger than Draymond, but he played that role for, for his teams wherever he went. Well, you know something, Michael was, you know, Michael was a consistent player. And I remember in the playoff games in Kansas City, he had like 40 points. He had 40 points and 12 or 13 mm -hmm. rebounds. He had a big game against that. And um, we should have won that because we were going back home to win to win that series. And we got, um, we just got, oh, Birdsong got hot. Oh, this Birdsong got hot, I think, in yeah. that game. We lost that game. So the thing is that Michael moved on. And, um, you know, the funny thing is, you know, you had a great career. And they got into, um, got into the radio. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to babysit his kids. Even though my kids were supposed to babysit them, they would come over. And they were so well behaved. I told Julie that, which is Michael's wife, the other day. When they would come over, they sit right in front of that TV, quiet. And Clay was always quiet. He would never talk. He was quiet. Yeah. Grace was kind of quiet. And they would just sit there and be so well behaved. But you have to be a very proud father, Michael, to have three guys to make the makes pro ball. Now, how's Tracy? Tell us how all of them are doing now. We know what Clay is doing, but how's the rest of them doing? Yeah, man, I tell you, I'm very blessed. Not because my boys are pro athletes, but because they're good human beings. Uh, they all never gave us any trouble. I mean, of course, they were kids, and sometimes they would drive you nuts with the choices they made, but nothing horrible or anything like that. And they've uh, been good sons to us, good brothers to each other, good friends to their friends. And uh, they grew up and appreciated everything that we gave them and they had as kids. They didn't act like spoiled brats, even though they grew up in a privileged lifestyle. And they're very conscious about sharing uh, their good fortune with their friends who were less fortunate. So they would always come over to our house and make sure their friends could get fed and hang out with uh, with them and have fun with them. 
And, um, you know, they all grew up to be uh, good young men and good athletes because uh, they take after their mother, who's a very athletic woman, played volleyball, ran track, did gymnastics. And, um, and so we grew up in Lake Oswego area with uh, Kermit and Kevin Love and all those guys. And uh, we had a, they had a great childhood. They always say that. And um, to see them all succeed and reach their goals, even Michael, my oldest, didn't play in the NBA a long time, but he did get there for a minute and got to play for the Cleveland Cavaliers for a couple of months, got a taste of the NBA. Now he's an assistant coach on the staff of the Warriors. And of course, Clay Trace is now the starting center fielder for the Dodgers. He's 32 oh, next month. But he's yeah. got a he's built like LeBron, who's a baseball player, just strong as an ox. Remember when he was a kid? We used to call him Baby yep. Shaq. He was so strong. Yeah. Look at that boy. Yeah. He's but like you know, that now, he, he looks, he, Yeah, he yeah. looks like a Kermit Washington in a baseball uniform. No. He's just he's just muscular and strong and crushing the ball. So he's Where 32, he but 32, well, but his body. That's, that's not old for baseball. No, he can play until he's 40 because he takes care of himself. So he can easily be a slugger until he's 40 years old and carve himself out a nice career and set himself up for, for life financially. So we're very blessed to see these boys uh, reach their goals and uh, live out, live their dream. Well, listen, Tio, you don't realize that Michael had a huge house in Lake Oswego and he would hide from the boys and get his newspapers. <laughs> yeah. never They've been looking for dad. Where's dad? He would hide so he could read the newspaper. And Michael would have yeah. a thousand newspapers laying all over the place. He would tear them up yeah. and watch what his uh, article. Oh, I don't know who cleaned up after that boy, but these kids were these kids were sweet. They really were. And um, it, you know what? I you know what you told me how good he was, and I told David Falk. Remember that? I said David Falk, you should go after Clay Thompson. Well, he's not going to be a top player. I said, hey, I said go after him. You know what David Falk said a couple of years? I mean, after he missed that, he said. Kermit, you're right. I missed on Clay Thompson. That boy's going to be real, real good. And he has. Yeah. He, he's, so how's his health now? Because I'm looking and look good the other night. How's yeah, he's back. After two years off because of those injuries, he says he feels like his legs are finally back. And then everybody told him it was going to take a good year for him to feel like his old self again. And he's right on that timeline now. He says he feels like his legs are back. He feels in better shape. And he feels like his old self again before the injury. So he's very blessed. He... You know, he did the rehab to get his work. He did the work. He put the work in to get back here. And I tell you, a lot of prayer went up for that boy. Uh, a lot of people were praying for him. And I believe in the power of prayer. I believe in God. And uh, I believe that those prayers were answered and that helped him to recover to this stage. No doubt in, in my mind about that. Yeah, that had to be tough when when uh, when he went down initially, even much less the second time around and had the, the setback. But um, can, can you tell us, what, from your perspective, what was that like after you've probably seen a lot of those kind of injuries teammates and opponents over the years, but then to have your own son go through that. Well, the first time when he tore his ACL, you know, even though as tough as that was, when he, at the time I said, I told him, I said, listen, Clay, you're going to be back. The days, as Kermit knows, the days uh, modern technology and yeah. uh, science is so much better than 30, 40 years ago when we were playing. So I said, mm -hmm. these doctors are going to fix you up. Many guys now have come back from this injury, the ACL tear, and you're going to be back to your normal self. So any after a year, he was working out, and sure enough, he was feeling good. And he was working out. Next thing you know, bam, he he tears his Achilles. And I say, oh my goodness, now this is going to be tough because how do you go through this two years in a row mentally? That's the mental part. Is mm -hmm. I got to yeah. go through this again, and it's a whole different injury. And again, I told him, and the doctor told him how it was torn. It was a good way to tear it. It wasn't completely shredded, yeah. so they'd be able to fix it good. And I said, Clay, well, you know, I know it's tough mentally, and I don't blame you for being down, but you got to keep things in perspective as frustrating as this is yeah. you're not a cancer patient you're not a kid with cancer and a cancer right. ward you'll be back you'll be back so we gotta think there are people who are way worse off than you right now who wish, wish they only can deal with your injuries compared to what they're going through uh, uh, physically and medically so i said as tough as this is mentally just stay focused stay patient and you'll be back you're only 31 32 years of age and if you take care of your body and do what you're supposed to do. You'll play until you're 40 and make up for the two years you lost. Especially because especially he's a shooter. Now, when he got hurt, right. did he come down and stay with you guys? He yeah, he down was down. 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 He came down uh, uh, for, with his ACL injury. He was down in L.A. a lot doing his rehab. And then when he did his, his uh, Achilles, the Warriors wanted him to stay in the Bay Area to do his rehab up there to keep him around his teammates to keep his morale up. Because when he was away from the team, he was kind of down, kind of sad. But being around the team for the second injury, 
it kept his morale up. He kept him involved with the team, kept him feel like, made him feel like he was still a part of the team, even though he wasn't playing again. So they wanted him to be around the team for the second injury so he wouldn't be in better spirits being around his teammates. You know, I like to tell you this. I watch your son play because I knew him. And I know him is that I was so proud of him when he would play well. I would turn the TV on to make sure your son was playing well. If he got in foul trouble, I get upset, I cut the TV off. So, you know, I, it, it's almost like watching, I mean, not my son, but it's almost like you're watching gymnastics. You're man on the balance beam. You're afraid that they're going to fall off, and you just say, oh, don't fall off. They play, get, get, it, get it done. And when he had that, what, 38 points in a quarter or a half? What was that, Michael? That when He still has a record for that, I think. What was yeah, it? 37, point, 37 points in one quarter. 37 points in one quarter against the Kings. And, and only not, not in 12 minutes. He, he caught, he, for the first two and a half minutes of that quarter, he didn't score. He scored 37 points in nine and a half minutes. Yeah. That was incredible. That was incredible. And were you watching that game live or were you just you had to watch it on TV the next, I mean, on, on, on the internet the next day or something? Thank goodness the modern technology and uh, streaming services on our cell phones. I was able to. We were on a plane getting ready to uh, fly from somewhere to someplace else after our game because we were uh, on, a, I think, in a central time zone. So uh, we were ahead um, uh, on the time. So we were sitting in my seat, and I, was, and I remember watching that, and I was like, boy, Clay's hot. He just hit his four, four shots in a row. This was in the third quarter against the Kings. So Clay's on. Then he hit his fifth in a row, then six in a row. I said, uh-oh, what's going on here? So I got to watch it live. And uh, watch that, uh, hit, watch it make history live. That's um, that's amazing. Uh, Thirty-seven points oh. in nine and a half minutes. I don't know if that will <laughs> ever be ever be broken. Nah, that's cool. Or that, oh, you know what? They got these guys scoring now. I mean, you have, yeah. Yeah. I was going to say too. Like I, I remember uh, I went to see my younger brother play in football, and um, they were just run, 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 run. You know, and then one time they drop back and throw a bomb, and he catches he catches it in the end zone, and I was like overwhelmed. You know, hearing the crowd go nuts and all that stuff. I can't even imagine what that would feel like for you when you've seen your boys do things like what I remember seeing Clay, you know, uh, in that particular game, for example. Or, you know, I'm a big Bulls fan and I'm watching the Bulls game in three quarters. He's got 14 threes and it doesn't have to play in the fourth quarter. I, I can't even imagine as a dad to see your, your, your boys accomplish these things that very well could never happen again. How, how proud you must be. Well, it's a uh, it's bittersweet. It's ecstasy and it's agony because you're right. When things are going well like that, setting records and just being on a roll, it is euphoric to sit there and watch your kid accomplish these goals. Or when I watch Trace play baseball and he comes up, their run is in scoring position, second and third, and it's the bottom of the ninth or something like that, and yeah. and in a big game, and he's got all he's got to do is put the ball in play. And they can win, and he strikes out. Oh, you just—it just—I it just tears you up when you see us when your kids don't come through. So it's—it's it's a little bit, it's bit, a bit, of, it's a bit of both. It just drives you crazy when they can't make a shot, or they strike out in a big moment in the game, or of course if they hit a home run, a walk off home run, or a walk off hit, or something like right. that. It is the best feeling in the world, way better than any feeling you have as a, a personally in the, in the athletic field or any professional moment because you want your kids to be so much more successful than you ever were. Well, well, Michael, tell me this. If you were talking to a parent or younger parents that have kids that have potential, what would you tell them? I mean, because you weren't a person that pushed them. You know, even though you would direct them and talk to them, you weren't one of these parents that was screaming, you got to do this, you got to do that. <laughs> a helicopter dad. <laughs> yeah. You're not like that. What, what, would you, what advice would you give parents with a kid that has that kind of potential but you want them to make it, you want them to work hard, but you don't want to be a, per, a parent that pushes so hard you make the kids stop playing. Yeah, if your son or daughter has the passion to pursue whatever sport they're in and they really want to be successful at it and take it to as far as they could, first they got to have that passion. And of course, you got to have skills too, of course, but if they got the passion to go along with the skills, then as a parent, I would suggest they find them, put them in the right coaching situations and then sit back and let the coaches coach. You'll be able to tell if the coach is good, is the right coach for your son or daughter. And uh, once you find that right coach, then just be there, be their parent, and be there to support them. And if they ask you for advice, be willing to give it, of course. But don't, like you say, try to insert yourself too much with too much advice if you know they're getting the right uh, coaching and the right teaching. And you see that they're enjoying playing for a certain coach, then let them have their space 
and you just be there to support them by sitting in the stands. Okay, Michael, since we talked about that, tell us about now the NBA right now. What do you think? How do you think the NBA is doing? And the Lakers, you think they have a shot to make the playoffs? And what do you think of the NBA as a whole? NBA is good. The league continues to get bigger and better. Uh, offense is a pretty, pretty uh, benign, pretty cookie cutter. High, uh, see every center now set a screen and roll and shoot three three point shot after three point shot. So offenses aren't as creative as when we played, Kermit. When you had plays and you had weak side action and you would just call out a play and and you would uh, know what play it is when you when you watch an nba game now it seems like every time out you'll see the coach bring out his chalkboard and draw up a play curve back in our day we'd go the coach would call a timeout we sit down in front of the coach coach would sit down in front of us right away and say okay we need to run 52 we need to run fist up we need to run yeah. one out when we come out let's run some backdoor cuts let's do a 54 cross they would just tell us and what the number was, what the play was, as opposed to sitting there drawing it up as, the, as if they're drawing it up in the dirt. So I don't think coaches today are as creative offensively. You don't see them running as many plays. And then if the play breaks down, it's just one-on-one, -on -one, shoot a three. So, but, you know, yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah. I think yeah. athletes are better today, Kermit. They, they jump oh, yeah. higher, they're yeah. bigger, they run faster. But I don't think they're better basketball players fundamentally like we were because we had guys, big men, who could score with their back to the basket, who could, who could get 30 points a game. Now, those kind of guys are gone. They're out of the game, except for a couple of centers like MB, Joe Kitch, DeAndre Ayton. It's hard to find big guys who can get you 30 points a game anymore in the post. You know, Jack Ramsey had some plays where we had so many plays. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, and, but see, his plays were so good that everybody was involved all the time. You said right. a good exactly. thing, you could get it, or you had a backdoor play. It was very difficult yeah. to play defense against his offense because there were so many options for every player. You know, we had Adrian Dantley on the other day, um, Michael, and I was telling him, trying to check Adrian Dantley back then, just like Carl Malone and all these other players, the good players, they have play A, B, C, and D. They don't just look at them. If they're not open, go to somebody else. So you, you have to be in shape. You have to look at the film, know what the play is coming, look for the back screen. Because, you know, AD, yep. I mean, you, you know, we used to have to, Michael, I mean, most of the time, you and I, we had to check the best offensive player. And it, it could be Walter Davis, Adrian Danley, it could be, name it. You just go up and down the, the ladder of all these great players. And you better be ready because you don't want to get humiliated. You know, we're, and we were talking to Marcus Johnson and stuff like that. And it, it, this, these guys, there were so many good small forwards. And sometimes we had to chase these guys all the time. Yeah, yeah, guys with more skill, more Bernard King. Don't forget about him. I have to chase oh. him around. Um, Terry Cummings was a good. So yeah. he right there. Yeah, yeah, Terry was a Terry, was Terry, top Terry, top. Terry, Terry was strong. Oh boy. Yeah, I think I think back in those days, you had players who were better shooters than we have today. Guys who you see a lot of wing players now. They call them wing players now. Are more athletic. They're more defensive minded, and you can leave them open and not worry about them knocking down shots. But not back in our day. Because we didn't rely on three so much. We were mostly shooting uh, two-pointers. So guys could shoot the ball. You had to guard guys back then. Yeah, there's things are different. So, Michael, you with the Lakers now, you do the radio with them. Um, yep. do you, so you travel with them all the time? Yeah, everywhere they go. Uh, everywhere they go, we go, I go with them. And, uh, you know, we traveled uh, charter, as you know. We stay in six-star hotels. Kermit, they give us uh, – they, they lay out buffet food for us to eat. <laughs> Uh, it's unbelievable the treatment these guys get today. Even though we still get per diem, you really don't have to spend it because, Kermit, there are, there's food there's food uh, in the morning when we wake up, buffet style. There's a lunch, buffet style. When they go to the arena, T.O. and Kermit, there's a buffet in front of the uh, uh, locker room you can eat two, an hour before game. I don't know how guys do that, eat an hour before game, but it's there if they want it. After the game, if, uh, after the game there's food outside the locker room, buffet style. Uh, fish, steaks, chicken, rice, mm. potatoes, whatever they want, salad. And then if we stay in overnight, we get to the hotel and there's food there at the hotel waiting for us. It's amazing how but you know, well that's good though, Michael. Now. Because after games, yeah, we played, it was nothing open. It was nothing open. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was nothing we open. Back in our day, waiting. yeah, back yeah. in our day, sometimes in some, some of the hotels we stayed in didn't have 24 hour service. So if you didn't get back by 11 p.m., you better hope yeah, you can no. find a Denny somewhere. 
And then we had to get up, we had to get up really early in the morning yeah. to get your first plane to the next city. Yep. And we're not talking you know, about the thing is, Yeah. But the thing is though, we knew we had to do it, TO. So we just did it. We put it in our mind. This is our job. Right. We play in Dallas tonight, 5 30 in the morning. We got to get off, get up the first one so we can catch a flight to Houston and play that night. And uh, then after that game, we might have to go fly to, uh, to uh, say, uh, Orlando and play on the third night. And But we set our minds to do it. We didn't worry about load management and complain about our schedule because this was our job. So mentally, yeah. you prepare yourself to do it, and we just did it. That's a good point, Michael. You know what? Because I used to, when I worked for the union, um, when Kobe came into Washington, he was hurt before, and he came in there and just destroyed Washington. And I said to Kobe, after the game, he says, Kobe, you know you're hurt. How do you play that well when you're hurt? He says, first of all, I'm going to play every game I can play. He says, because people in Washington and the East Coast only get to see Lakers one time. And they might save right. all their money that they have to bring their son or their daughter to see me play. And I don't want them to see me sitting on the bench. He says, so if I can play, I'm going to play. And I wish more players, Michael, had that kind of attitude because if they're not a star, so what? So we, we don't care. But if you're right. LeBron, you're, we, they yep. go to see, we turn the TV on to see a certain player. We go to a game to see a certain player. Michael, what do you think of that now? What's going on this, uh, with management? What is this load management? You are echoing exactly what a young, young pup, a young 21-year-old Anthony Edwards said. He said he yeah. don't understand how guys to sit out when you're healthy, when you're the star, when you're the Anthony Edwards of the team, when you are the DeMar DeRozan, when you are the LeBron, uh, Kawhi Leonard, when you are Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, these guys. You're right. These are the these are the people, the fans, save them money to come see. You're right. They don't care if people like me and you sit out because they ain't coming to, no. they're coming to see Kareem. They're coming to see Magic. They're coming to see Bird, uh, Bird Kale, those kind of players, Embiid. Those are the people, those are the guys who sell tickets. And when you have... When you are that type of player, uh, Giannis, when you know you are the face of the franchise, the star, the all-pro, the all-world player, and you're the reason why people want to come to the games. Yes, they're coming to see the Milwaukee Bucks or the Philadelphia 76ers, but they're coming to see you because it's you. You're a great player, and you're healthy. You have to play. And like yeah. Charles Barkley says, they're just asking you to play basketball, not to go work in a steel mill for 80 hours a week around heat and, and, and be dirty and all that stuff. You're playing basketball. And if you want to rest, you can rest the next day. Don't go to practice. Tell the coach that you stay home and lay on the couch and recover that way. Or if you are a little bit tired and you don't want to play 40 minutes, then play 20 minutes. But let at least let the fans see you on the floor. Yes, yes, that's true. Michael, you know what? One thing about you we were watching yesterday, um, T.O. was here. He came up from San Diego, the engineer, and the co-host. We were watching The Last Dance. And I didn't realize that Michael played so many seasons and didn't miss a game. I don't know how many games that was, like eight or nine seasons, didn't miss a single game because he knew people came to see him play. Like, if you're going to see Michael Jackson in the Jackson 5, well, you know what? Jackson 5, okay, but if Michael's not there, come on. You don't want, you want your exactly. money back. Okay, tell me this, Michael. Yeah. Tell me this. If you're in Brooklyn, now I would be upset. If I paid that money to see Durant and Kyrie Irving and they both are gone, you want your money back. Well, they still got good players. I like Mikhail Bridges. They've got some good young talent there. So even though you lost your stars, look, Brooklyn is still a good, uh, exciting young team to watch. Yeah, you don't have a Kevin Durant or Kyrie, but you still have good players there. They're not a bunch of scrubs. Uh, so they, they've revamped that, uh, rebuilt the lineup there, to rebuilt the roster. But they've got some good young players. But even though you, you're missing two all-NBA players there, but at least Brooklyn is still competitive and still fun to watch. And speaking about Michael Jordan playing 82, do you know that John Stockton who played 20 years or something like that? Yeah. I think out of those 20 years, I think 17 of those years he played 82 games. Seven, yeah. so eight, how about that? Tio, how many games did he miss in his career? I think Tio, you missed, was it four? Um, I can't remember how many. I know there was one year where he had a, a, rel like a relatively extended injury, and then after, other than that, it was. And him and Carl Malone. Every, every oh, Carl Malone was another. He didn't miss all the eight games either. But you know what? We, we tried to play every game. We were hurt a lot of times. Just like, I only think I yeah. need a couple of years with, without missing a, a season, but I did have 200 games in a row without missing. I should have missed a lot of them. 
But when it comes back, yeah, well, a lot of you didn't want to miss your spot, though, right? You don't want to take a chance you're losing your spot. Well, you, you can't play for a long time, huh? Well, well, you do. If somebody takes your spot and you play well, <laughs> you don't jump back in there. And that's why more yeah, that's people, you know, go ahead, Michael. We should. We should qualify it though, because I always qualify it. I always say a guy, I say like a guy like LeBron, right, who's played twenty years, or Chris Paul, who's played seventeen, eighteen. If they want to take a night off because of a load management, because of they've got so much wear and tear in their body, I don't begrudge them that. But if you're in your twenties, right. twenty two, twenty three, twenty four, and you're healthy, you should never take a night off if you're healthy. But Mike, they should take a night off at home games, not away games, because that's what the problem when people come. They want to come see them. They only get one chance. And yeah. we were talking, me and Tio were talking about it one time that um, you probably, we were probably doing a radio together in Portland when Michael got suspended and missed the Phoenix game. And people wanted to sue the NBA because they had suspended him because of something happened. Oh, yeah. it, was a, it was a double overtime game in Utah. And at the end, it was a, a questionable call when he, he, he fouled Jeff Malone. And um, that was going to seal it up because Jeff Malone was like a 99% free throw shooter going to the free throw line with a second to go. And he uh, was yelling at the ref, and he, and he grabbed his arm, and they, they like tossed him, and uh, he missed the Phoenix game right before the All Star game. Yeah, and then the people in Phoenix, because they only see him once, they were ready to right. shoot. Yeah. Like, yeah. Burn the house down. Yeah, but what they should have done is say, okay, we're not going to suspend him for Phoenix, but when he goes home, he's going to miss a game at home. Yeah. I mean, what do you think about that, Michael? Because these people come see these guys. You know, yeah, see yeah, you, yeah. You can't suspend your mega stars. Let's say if a mega star says something or you know, let's well you know they say you can't throw a punch or a slap even if it misses but they got to find some way to 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 say you know we'll find you instead of suspend you just find them 100 grand but let him play because as you're right the paying customers you got to think of your customers first above everything else because without those customers without those fans we ain't got no league i have one more question for you michael and i appreciate you coming the All-Star Game, and I don't want to ever knock down the NBA because the NBA is good to me, good to you, <laughs> all the stuff like that. The All-Star Game, Michael, they don't play any defense. The great players don't get in the dunk contest. The great players don't get in the three-point shooting anymore. Michael, what do you think is happening in the league that is not as entertaining in All-Star Games? All-Star events aren't as, as entertaining anymore. The All-Star Game is a disgrace. It's an embarrassment to the league. And now Adam Silver can sit up there as commissioner and allow this to continue just baffles me. Uh, the other day they were praising Jason Tatum for breaking the all-star game scoring record of 55 points. Well, Kermit, you and me at our age going to go out there and got 30 if nobody's guarding us. I mean, that was ridiculous. <laughs> like <laughs> yeah, well, it was basically a layup line and a dunk line. It wasn't like they were playing, playing competitively, and it's been that way now for years. And you're right, um, the guys don't want to do the dunk contest anymore because it comes down to pride. And, uh, and having pride in your job and, and uh, wanting to prove to us that you're the best. Back in the day, Kobe and Jordan and all the greats. Oh, the guys, wrestler, Kersey, pride, yeah, they, all wanted to, they all took pride. They all took pride and say, yeah, yeah, I can be the best dunk. I can be the best this or that. Now, guys make so much money and they don't care. Yeah. They'll say, oh, well, who cares? Like John Morant saying, I'll never do the dunk contest. I mean, you yeah. would think you'd want to do it just to well, show people what you can do. Zion Williamson. So to, to yeah. fix the dunk contest, they, with the, listen, if you go to YouTube, there are great dunkers out there throughout YouTube. Yeah. There's guys who can dunk. Bring those guys in. Yeah, bring eight of them, bring six, about five of those guys in to put on a show. And let them do the dunk contest. A million, a million, yeah. a million yeah. dollars goes to the winner. They put on a great show. And then the oh, All-Star absolutely. Game, All-Star Game itself, cancel it. Just cancel it. They don't need it anymore. Just like the NFL canceled a Pro Bowl because guys didn't really want to play in it anymore. They weren't trying. The same thing with the yeah. All-Star Game. It needs to be canceled. Yeah, I, I, sometimes I feel like, too, a lot of guys maybe don't want to get in. Like you said, it could be the ego where I can't lose if I'm not participating. You know, they don't want to, they just don't want to take the chance of losing it, you know. But it was so, so fortunate. Go ahead, yeah, Michael. how about go that? Ahead. How about that mindset? How about being afraid to lose? How about right. you know, going out there and saying, I, I'm, I, I don't care who's in this, I'm going to win. How about that attitude? Exactly, yeah, yeah. You know, back then with the three-point shoot, you know, first of all, we used to talk about the dunk contest. The greatest players in the ABA participated in the dunk contest, yeah. participated yeah. in the three-point shooting, and all the other things they participated, they weren't afraid. Larry Bird got out there. I mean, they, but yeah, Steph Curry did a tremendous job when he was doing it. Yeah. And But then all of a sudden, the dunk contest, everybody, we don't even know the guys that are in the dunk contest. They might be off the bench somewhere else. Well, 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 even this year, I mean, it, 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 it was it was pretty fun, but, you know, Mac McClellan is not 
like a, 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 a full-time NBA player as far as, you know, I understand. I mean, he was on uh, a couple different teams already just kind of in and out, but and he kind of saved it uh, to some degree as far as getting attention on it. Well, Michael, I, I mean, you have any more questions for Michael? No, hey, Michael, thank you for coming on. Um, you know, from the radios, we used to do radio together 20 some years ago. Take care. Okay. All right, you. you bet. I appreciate it.